Guinea is situated close to the former Irian Jaya, is now known as West Papua. It seems to be a hidden place, as though the land itself wants to retain its age-old mystique. Indeed, this region of the world has in fact remained somewhat anonymous. It was only in the 1930s that American millionaire Richard Archibald discovered this, until then, unknown and untouched world. The aircraft begins its descent. Its wings are already piercing through the cloud cover when suddenly a fascinating and magical world comes into view. The Baliam Valley is not only West Papua's high valley, it is also the home of a unique indigenous people, the Dani. In the dense and virtually impenetrable forest regions of the Baliam Valley and its surrounding highlands, there are numerous tribes, but it is the Dani who are the most populous tribe of this region. It is only relatively recently that the airplane has made the remote town of Wamina readily accessible to visitors. After the plane has landed safely, the relief of the passengers is plain to see as this Fokker F-27 aircraft must be more than a few years old. The Pasar Nayak market provides visitors with a good idea of the exotic agricultural products that are grown by the Dani who are known to be skillful farmers. Despite the culture of the various primitive tribes that live here, both the appearance and character of the city of Vamina has changed dramatically over the past 20 years. At the beginning of the 1980s, Vamina was only a small village occupied by the Dani. However, the regular air service to New Guinea's main harbour and capital city has now speeded up its development. Cement, corrugated iron and motor vehicles have since been flown into the rapidly expanding city. Today, Varmina has a population of about 12,000. Tradesmen have also become used to the influx of foreign visitors and have thus adapted their range of products accordingly. Traditional goods are the most popular items offered for sale. The marketplace provides an ideal opportunity to see the indigenous people of Papua New Guinea at close quarters. Although there are around eight flights each day to Vamina, the local population still appears to be fascinated by welcome strangers. Vamina is the last source of supply prior to the wilderness beyond, so it's best to take advantage of this and stock up with anything that may be needed for the journey ahead. The Dani people were once nomadic and inhabited the coastal regions of Western Papua. The Melanese drove the Dani deeper into the central mountain regions where they subsequently settled. Just outside a Dani village, a guard is looking out for unexpected guests. But we are welcome, and so the journey continues to the village, and past one of the most important animals of the Dani people. The pig is not only a source of food, but also of great importance in the ancient rituals of these primitive people. Local women announce our pending arrival. In the village, a great welcoming committee greets us. 
Body painting and adornments made of feathers and plants are most impressive. A truly statesman-like reception. For several centuries, the Dani people lived here unnoticed by both missionaries and explorers. Until in 1938, an American, Richard Archibald, ventured into the Baliem Valley. His discovery was soon made known all over the world. In the almost impassable mountain region of New Guinea, Archibald had discovered a people that was living an almost Stone Age existence. The Dani were completely detached from modern civilization. They rarely met anyone from outside their own tribe. Tropical rainforests and difficult terrain had long served as a natural protection against any change to their culture. Simple body adornments are of great importance here. Papua New Guinea, the paintings are a symbol of the social status of each individual member of the tribe. This woman stands out from the others. Her body is covered in clay as she is in mourning for a close member of her family who has recently passed away. Body paintings are mainly reserved for festive occasions such as weddings, various hunting and healing ceremonies. Suddenly, the people begin to move around restlessly. But it is not a sign of hostility. In fact, the opposite is true, as it's just another form of traditional welcoming. The movement of the villagers marks the beginning of a major celebration. Despite all the recent changes to their country, the Dani have managed to preserve most of their cultural heritage right up to the present day. During the ritual, there are many opportunities to observe the splendid body ornaments of the local people. Children also play an active role in this ancient custom that is accompanied by the loud chants of the entire village community. After a while, the village elders retire. Beneath a tree, various tribal members discuss the finer details of the forthcoming celebration and particularly which animal to select for slaughter. The pig has always played an important part in the lives of this primitive people. They were once used as a form of currency. The theft of a pig often led to savage battles between neighboring villages. The pig is not the only treasured animal of the Dani. Recently, the cow was introduced here. They are the pride of the village and so are supervised by the male villagers both day and night. Animal thieves are a problem here. New 
news of the celebration spreads far and wide. These women who are crossing the river come from a nearby village. The young women are wearing handmade skirts made of sour leaf. At first it seems as though these boys are bathing, but this is not so. They're fishing. They don't have to wait long for their first catch. They proudly show off their prize, which isn't very big. However, the fish here are extremely tasty. Close to the village is a salt spring that is of great importance to the everyday life of the local population. Salt is a rare and much needed commodity in these parts. The production of this important mineral is, as with so many other aspects of daily life for the Dani people, the work of women. This is where the amazing improvisational talent and skill of these people manifests itself, even though their methods may at first appear to be somewhat primitive. To visitors, their work methods are like something from the Stone Age. The techniques may indeed seem to be archaic to outsiders but they have nevertheless proven to be extremely effective. Banana leaves are dipped into the water of the spring until they eventually absorb the salt that it contains. The leaves are then chewed. Following this, the banana leaves are taken back to the village where they are dried and eventually burned. This produces a salty tasting ash that is still very popular with these tribal folk. The men of the village have gone to gather firewood. To highlight the importance of the celebration, the fire will be far larger than normal. Until only a few decades ago, the splitting of wood was achieved by the use of stone axes and other Stone Age type tools. Today the work has been made much easier by the use of more modern tools. However, there are still not enough modern tools for all the men of the village, and so most of them use wooden spears to cut the wood. Today around half the Dani people are divided into 12 major tribal groups that live in the Baliam Valley. With well over 100,000 members, they're the largest ethnic group in New Guinea. In the center of the village, there is a rectangular fireplace that contains heat absorbent stones that will eventually act as an oven in which both meat and vegetables will be cooked. More wood is brought to the fire. It's broken down into smaller pieces by hand or by use of the knee that at times can prove to be rather painful. 
again, the Stone Age never seems to be too far away. The village chief also joins in with the preparations for the coming celebration. The fire becomes stronger in order that the stones will absorb the maximum amount of heat and preserve it for as long as possible. While the men tend to the fire, the Dani women are engaged in the lighter work within the fields that surround the village. When it comes to lighting a fire, the centuries-old traditions of the Dani are clearly evident today. Though a box of matches would certainly make things a lot easier. Heat is created by friction until the small pile of straw finally begins to glow. Although this doesn't necessarily mean that the fire has been lit. Next, great care is taken. Only by some well-timed blowing, much instinct and a great deal of experience does the ancient ritual eventually lead to a successful conclusion. This vital technique has been handed down from generation to generation, as fire is one of the most important elements of human survival. The ability to create fire was probably one of the most important achievements of the Dani people. At night, the temperature falls considerably. The mountain areas can be very cold, yet these native people are scantily clad. While the fire establishes itself, the women prepare to cook. This little boy offers his mother some branches and straw, but she estimates that there's already enough fuel on the fire. Before cooking begins, an animal must first be slaughtered. Again, the Dani adhere to an ancient ritual. A long arrow shot at point-blank range is meant to kill the pig. Two men hold the animal while another aims an arrow at its heart single arrow is released. <coughs> Unfortunately, the pig is not killed immediately. The sight of the injured pig is not a pretty one. This particular tradition is much frowned upon by most of the foreign guests. After several minutes, the animal finally dies. A number of the villagers have already painted their faces. A boy carries the dead pig to an area that is covered with leaves. A curious puppy has arrived and watches the men. 
The New Guinea dingo, or Holstrom dog, is the traditional domestic animal of the Dani people. First, the pig's ears are removed. For this, old and primitive knives are used. The women are busy preparing an oven made of earth, which they cover with grass and leaves. The oven is secured with several large lengths of liana. Today, the construction of the oven is the responsibility of the women. The liana is tightly wrapped around the high piled fire. Thus, the oven is protected and secure. Finally, the preparation of the feast has been completed. The result is quite remarkable. And now there's a healthy looking fire. But now, it's time to wait. In normal everyday life, the men dig the fields, maintain the irrigation systems and ensure that all their livestock fences are in a good state of repair. The daily life of the villagers is defined according to gender. Some of the women take advantage of this long waiting period to pursue their needlework. For the men, it's a good time to relax following their arduous work in the fields. Tobacco is popular in this remote region of Papua New Guinea. Cigarettes contrast strangely to the body painting and traditional ornaments of the Dani. The women suddenly focus upon their children and pay special attention to their hair. Lice and other parasites are quite common within these village communities. So delousing is an important job. Smoking is not only the preserve of the men, the women also enjoy a cigarette. The most striking and characteristic attire of the men is a tubular fallow crypt or penis covering made of dried gourd that in the language of the Dani is known as a kotika. Most of their traditional dress consists of magnificent feathers and plants. The strip of material worn around their neck is meant to protect them from evil spirits. The women are responsible for the upbringing of the children and attend to all of their many needs. In addition to bringing up the children, working in the fields and tending to their farm animals, 
The Dani women also make net carrier bags in which they place vegetables and fruit and transport it to the local markets that are located in the Baliam Valley. This woman has lost several of her fingers. This was not the result of an accident, but was caused by an old and cruel custom that still takes place today. This gruesome and painful ritual was carried out in order to honor various spirits whom the villagers wished to impress with this bloody sacrifice. Suddenly, the villagers begin to stir. A man walks up to the fire and places the pig on top of it. But the anticipation of the hungry guests who are expecting an early meal is soon thwarted. The tribesman only sears off the pig's bristles. Till now, the fire had not been used to cook the pig, but only to heat up the stones. Regardless of the increasing number of visitors and the many modern devices that could be employed here, the Dani still cling to their ancient and somewhat drawn out cooking methods. A man begins to break down the smoldering mound. Others prod the fire with long sticks. At first, it's not apparent why they're doing this. It doesn't seem to have had much effect. Some prefer to use this time to converse with a neighbor. It's all rather perplexing for those of us not from these shores. Work on the oven has still not been completed. Additional leaves are piled on top of the fire by the Dani women. The Western visitors gradually begin to understand the reason why the men have been prodding the fire. They're trying to locate the stones that have been heated in the middle of the fire for several hours. Their sticks are like huge forks and tweezers. With much effort, the stones are lifted out of the cinders and carried over to the oven. The work is far from easy and takes a certain degree of skill. Now almost all of the men are searching for hot stones and are taking them to the other side of the square with their sticks. Finally, the stones are placed carefully in the oven. Almost all the work of the Dani, such as farming, livestock breeding, and the building of houses, is divided amongst each villager. Everyone is aware of his or her daily responsibilities.
disputes within the village community are extremely rare. While the men continue to carry the hot stones, the oven grows bigger and bigger. The faster method of grilling meat on an open fire seems to be completely ignored by the Dani. For thousands of years, they've been following their age-old traditions. These primitive people prefer to cook meat in a far more refined way. The hot stones, along with the freshly picked leaves, create steam that gradually cooks the meat. Several layers of the heated stones are carefully placed around the sides and at the bottom of the fire. Further villagers add more grass and leaves until the oven becomes even larger. Earth-made ovens are not only in use among the various primitive peoples of New Guinea, but are also common within the entire Pacific region. For those who had no knowledge of clay or metal, the earth oven proved to be a vital method of cooking. Another layer of grass is placed on the oven. After the men have finished their labors, they turn their attention to leisure. Music is also part of the celebrations. Now the party is really beginning to get underway. The music helps to take our attention away from our almost terminal hunger. Alas, the traditional feast will not begin for several hours to come. Sweet potatoes are laid on a layer of leaves within the oven. This is the most important food of the Dani. There are almost 100 different types of sweet potato. It makes up almost 90% of their diet. The sweet potatoes and all the other vegetables come from the fields that are located outside the village in various deforested areas that were created solely for the purpose of cultivating the potato. A wise move, as this form of potato is quite delicious, if only we could taste it. Eventually, someone begins to clean the pig. Due to the division of work, each villager is able to perform almost any task. But today is an exception to the rule. Old bamboo knives are really no match for the hard bones of a pig. Thus the butchering of the pig turns out to be rather a challenge. The simple bamboo knives that have been in use here for thousands of years cause an even greater delay to our now desperate appetites. The cutting of the joints is proving to be one of the skills 
not enjoyed by the man with the knife. Some of the onlookers offer mixed advice. At first they disagree, but after a little hesitation, it's clear that the original butcher has a deeper understanding than any of his colleagues, and so he resumes his work. Attracted by the smell of the meat, a couple of curious puppies approach the butchered animal. The people gathered around the earth oven are anxious to taste the meat. The sweet potatoes are cooking nicely. The rest of the villagers pass their time with chit-chat and cigarettes. Smoking is a popular sport. The butchered pig is proudly presented to one and all and is taken to the oven. To the delight of the hungry villagers and their even hungrier guests. Only a few more hours and who knows, there may be something to eat. After the meat has been placed in the oven, it's covered with a layer of soil and grass. From now it will take from two and a half to four hours or more, depends on the size of the oven, before the meat is ready to eat. The idyllic atmosphere of this village is deceptive. Despite the fact that the Dani tribe was only discovered in the 1930s, their life has since gone through much transformation. But the Dani are not the only primitive people of West Papua that have felt the increasing pressure of nearby industrial nations. Several other tribes have also been affected in a similar way. The subject of much controversy, this region became part of Indonesia in 1963. Most here don't recognize this fact and with some justification. The people of West Papua were assured that they would be given self-determination, but this promise has failed to reach fruition. For more than 40 years, they have sought their independence. However, today the village's pig ceremony is far removed from their ongoing dispute with the Indonesian government in Jakarta. Finally, our taste buds having almost seized up completely, the food is served. The native people of New Guinea decorate themselves with feathers, bones, fur and tusks thus attire themselves within their own ancient and mythological world. <laughs> Following the food, drums announce a dance that up until a few years ago was of much greater importance than it is today. The battle dance of the Dani is now only performed in honor of Western visitors.
The whole village moves excitedly to the singing and rhythmic beating of the drummers. The women also participate in this traditional battle dance. These impressive war dances have become one of the most characteristic features of this primitive people. Until relatively recently, the Dani were in an almost constant state of war. But they didn't battle against the growing number of Christian missionaries to their land, but amongst themselves. Unlike other regions of the world, the sustained efforts of the missionaries here had almost no effect on the lives of these tribal people. The Dani, as well as many other indigenous people of West Papua, single-mindedly clung to their ancient traditions and culture. Today, armed with spears and bows and arrows, the villagers are displaying their tribal march solely for demonstration purposes. Their last hostilities date back more than 20 years. Thus ritual warfare now plays an even greater role in the lives of the native people of New Guinea who wish to preserve the ancient traditions of their ancestors. To reenact the typical battles of old and make this one as authentic as possible, today the villages are divided into two groups. elevated lookout post constructed of several thin logs is of major strategic advantage for the defenders. A lookout post is normally used for surveillance of the surrounding area and to protect the women who work in the fields. Women were once frequently attacked here. These assaults often triggered short but serious hostilities with neighboring villages from where the troubles began. So the men in the lookout posts were a vital source of security. From this elevated location, the enemy and their long feathers are very plain to see. The armed attackers are permitted to come closer. They approach cautiously until conflict is unavoidable. But instead of battling with their enemy, both warriors and women begin to cry out and form a circle around the lookout post. Today's hostilities have now come to an end. The reason for the warlike behavior of the primitive people of New Guinea was not only caused by material reasons such as the theft of livestock and women, but was also often inspired by the spirit world that is still of great importance to the local people. These spirit-inspired wars were fought in order to placate the spirits of those warriors who had been killed in previous battles. Thus, revenge played a significant role among the Dani people.
The action around the lookout post begins to calm down until both groups become still. The war chants and battle cries continue while the leaders of the two groups talk with each other. The battles of the primitive people of West Papua cannot be compared to normal wars, as they usually cause far less harm. Relieved that today's ritual battle did not result in any injury, the warriors return home to their village that is surrounded by a defensive, although rather low, wooden fence. A type of bridge leads to the Dani village. All the best efforts of the Christian missionaries, as well as the Indonesian government, have not made these people swerve from the path of their ancient culture. Following their return to the village, one of the last duties of the warriors is to thank their ancestors for the success of today's battle. As part of their natural religion, ancestral worship still influences the lives of these fascinating people. In their world, much is based on the placation of various spirits that show themselves in numerous characteristics of the land and also of their forefathers. A male mummy is brought out of a honai, a traditional Dani hut, that is of great significance for this village. The dead of the Dani tribe are usually cremated. Mummification such as this is only reserved for the most important members of the village community such as great leaders and courageous warriors. According to the belief of these people, the spirits of these men are particularly powerful and dangerous as they're able to weaken the enemy prior to battle. Even today, the Dani still believe in the supernatural powers of the spirit world. This mummy is thought to be several hundred years old, and it's still treated with the greatest reverence by the villagers. Compared with the respect for the dead and the spirit world, the various relationships within a family are almost insignificant. Here the family is mainly influenced by practical considerations. Now the latecomers to today's ritual battle have arrived in the village, just in time to participate in yet another meeting. The farewell ceremony has once again involved the entire village. The determination and courage of these people to defy each and every effort to deter them from their unique lifestyle is perhaps the most striking fact to have been gleaned from our visit to this Dani village. This experience has made an indelible impression upon all of us. 
When we've left the village, its daily routine will return to normal and the Dani people will resume their work in the nearby fields. Although this village community has not been completely untouched by modern technology, this is still like a journey into the past and into the misty horizons of the distant Stone Age. Despite the discovery of their existence in the 20th century, the simple lifestyle of the Dani of West Papua continues to be intriguing, mysterious and totally fascinating.